Hey everybody, welcome to a brand new format for the Goodman Podcast. Welcome Raj, I'm, I'm keen to, uh, to see how this one kind of pans out. Uh, we've got something exciting for the, for the listeners. Absolutely, Megan. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you for this lovely new format. I'm excited about how it uh, how it turns out. <laughs> awesome. So let's dive straight in. Um, so what we're going to be discussing today is Microsoft's new AI language model. Um, it's called MAI-1. Um, I don't know if it's supposed to be my one. Uh, I suppose jury's out on um, on pronunciation. But uh, what's what's quite mind boggling about this? It features five billion parameters. Um, and they focus on achieving high accuracy while reducing power usage and inference costs. Uh, a, a number of training sources are being used, including text from uh, ChatGPT4 and web content, and it's built using NVIDIA's GPUs on a vast uh, server cluster. So that's just kind of an overview. So um, now, could you maybe explain what the implications are of the scale uh, five? Billion, uh, 500 billion parameters uh, in terms of performance and application potential. Uh, firstly, this is interesting that Microsoft is doing this. Obviously, they have a really interesting uh, inner company as well, OpenAI, which is in which they invested quite a lot of money. And uh, interesting that they are building their own large language model and their own models is something they are keen on because they have one of the, the better opportunities with OpenAI. But looking at what they're doing with 500 billion uh, parameters, it is in that territory of GPT-4 and beyond. It is a a big, big, big investment because to train these things, you need a lot of computational power, a lot of GPUs, and then to then do the inference as well. There's constant ongoing cost and requirements there. So big investment from their perspective, but it's not unusual. Everybody in the, the big tech space is doing it. Google is doing it. Amazon is working on it. They're investing money into other companies. Apple is doing their own thing, for example. It's, what's different about this is that they are using it in a particular way. They have a clear mindset that they're going to use data centers and run it in that way, which I think is really interesting. They, you know, they are Microsoft. They obviously have their own laptops. They have other devices as well. They could have thought about that as well, which, which I believe there is a effort there as well. But the, the big opportunity is big, large language models, they which will compete with the open AI uh, models. Funnily enough, they're using open AI to train it as well, which is which is interesting. <laughs> I don't know how don't know how that actually works internally. I wonder how what's the, the deal of this internally they're struck, but it's interesting. I think it will definitely help with with a lot of uh, problem solving. Is something which I'm sure they want to sell commercially, for example, with their Microsoft licenses, which is sell to corporates. So there is an opportunity for them, which is set up for so many years now, where they can sell in these different different tools and services. Overall, not surprised completely, but equally a bit not sure how will they work with OpenAI and maybe they come up with this with this tool. Yeah. Now, um, just I have a kind of down the rabbit hole question immediately off the bat. Um, and we've spoken before, I think, on one of our episodes about model decay. Um, now, if they're using uh, information and data from ChatGPT4 um, and potentially other sources, uh, you know, models are known to hallucinate, and uh, then that's obviously fed in, back into the, the training data, and you know, the model decays. So. Um, what do you think they're going to be doing uh, or how they, how are they going to kind of uh, alleviate this issue of model decay by using AI generated content to train another AI? I, I would say open AI has become very good at minimizing hallucination. They really have become good at it. There are many other tools which have also done similar job. They have become better at it. And ChatGPT 5, which we don't have access to so far, which probably they have internally already access to, perhaps has minimal amount of hallucination. So data created synthetically using large language models, LLMs, can be a good opportunity in the future. In fact, if you look at the training of many new models, they use existing large language models to create them. And this is not unusual. If you look at the way we program things, in a high code or low code, so 
if we, if we build, for example, something which is using you know, a proper app, for example, it uses very big building blocks. It doesn't use the small building blocks used for programming the chips because that's already been built. So similarly, you just use existing blocks and you slot them into, into programs and it works really well. Similarly, it's now become a norm to use synthetic data because the assumption is that the hallucination is minimal, that they can provide context and can create the data you might find difficult to create otherwise, and it's expensive and it's time consuming, so they want to avoid that completely. This has become the norm in many ways, and there will be a mix of both, and there will be something called human uh, human based learning, so there will be human human in the loop to correct the, the, the challenges, for example, so it's hallucinates less. But that combination of humans and, and uh, using LLMs has become a trend. Awesome. Now, obviously, the um, let, let's talk about architecture. So the, the emphasis has been on lower power consumption, reduced inference cost. What breakthroughs or innovations within the, the model's architecture are, are actually enabling these efficiencies? And how, how are these advancements going to influence the broader AI industry? I think, uh, yeah, great question, actually, Megan. I must say, I, I haven't read uh, about the the what are the architecture bits and these tend to be very proprietary for every llm but there is thing like intensive slicing for example there's um sort of um having parallel processing going on and, and all these different technologies or different approaches can make it much simpler to be more efficient um with computational power Again, this is just the advancement of large language models, right? The first one you have is inefficient. Just a poor job at it. Next thing you do is you improve the actual uh, answers or responses from LLMs. Then you have to optimize for data consumption and speed. This is just the way it works, right? So again, not surprised that there is efficiencies available. Many language large language models have now worked out a a simpler model, which can do much be much smaller. Uh, they have found ways to optimize, for example, based on slicing and dicing content as when required. In fact, if you look at Meta, which is really called Facebook, and their Llama 3, for example, is meant to be more efficient than Llama 2. And so is Open OpenAI as well. That's why they charge less money to run their four turbo API than the four, because they found ways to make it more efficient, cost them less, so they pass the savings onto the customer. And that's just the norm of technology. As you start building more stuff more regularly, you find ways to optimize it. And they have found ways to optimize it. It runs faster, runs better, and does the job quicker. Eventually, you'll find that this cost goes down quite a bit, and when you have the energy efficiency available from better hardware, which is only which, which has not been done a lot of at the moment, and NVIDIA is working on this alongside other people in the industry, we will see a, even a higher uh, opportunity to save money. In fact, people tell me that it could be 100 to 1,000 times cheaper to run the same query in the future, you say the next three years, for example, than today. So that's a big amount of money to be saved. And this is why if you're building open AI or AI tools, for example, stop worrying with the cost that much, think about the user, user applications because these costs will go down rapidly in the next few years. Hmm. Well, that's, I mean, that's basic economics with, uh, you know, uh, supply and demand. So as soon as it starts becoming kind of flooding the market, um, the price will automatically go down. So. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned earlier um, that, you know, Microsoft uh, is potentially including this in their own suite of tools because they've got um, hardware and, and obviously all their software already that, they've, uh, that they're have that they working with and that they have launched. Um, but now this particular AI model is probably too complex for deployment on customer devices. So we're not looking necessarily at, you know, downloading an app like ChatGPT onto your smartphone or, or even like an edge device sort of setup. Um, it's from what I'm kind of getting from the article, it's, it's intended for data center use. What are the potential benefits and drawbacks of 
this kind of deployment strategy. Okay, so let me kind of look at that. The way I look at this is that there are two kinds of AI available at the moment, which is one is the, the, the cloud-based computing, which, which is happening within the, the cloud clusters, and the other one is on your device. They're already on your device or edge AI available where the device doesn't link with the internet at all. It just in itself self-sufficient to give you responses. A simple example will be there are some photo editing tools which run an AI to maybe make your backgrounds blur or pixelate some text, for example. That's all done on your own device. The AI is in your own device, the link to the internet at all. But then there are the other ones which are typically like even open AI, for example, almost all of them, if not actually, in fact, all of them link to the internet. You need to have internet connectivity on a device to be able to query open AI or to call the AI in the cloud. And that is the typical model. But most companies in the future will have both. They will have a large form and a small form. Large form for complex queries for enterprise level, but also even for us as well. Sometimes the one on the device is not enough. But there also is a use case for smaller ones. For example, Meta has been building some smaller ones which can be which can be downloaded onto your phone. You can use all the 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 tool and the AI in your own device. It doesn't need to link to the internet at all and does a great job. Again, it's not as powerful as the big large language model that you have, but it helps to have both the options because of different use cases. Okay. Now um Let's talk about the uh, kind of democratizing design approach that Microsoft has taken because they've decided to open source, well, at least the smaller Pi 3 mini model. Um, and this kind of indicates a strategic approach to accessibility and community engagement in AI development. So what is the significance of this move and how might it affect the development of AI applic uh, applications by smaller entities or even individual developers? Yeah, great question there, uh, Megan. And the reality is, this is not a new strategy. Many of the companies who have not been able to penetrate the market with their closed source AI have built open source AI tech. Prime example is Facebook's Meta Llama, Llama 1, 2, 3, open source available for you to download. And that's a great strategy to in order to get penetration into the market. But also, when people in the community use it, develop on it, those learnings can be then be deployed into a closed source AI. This is what, you know, this is what Mark Zuckerberg has said recently, that we will release a lot of our stuff in open source approach. But also, we will have some bits that are close to us, and that's for us to have an advantage. But we're giving something away, and we're asking for something in return. And that's just the way the world works, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So that's one. No, number two is, if we look at the Android strategy, Android being Google's open source technology to use within our phones, Android phones. But to use it, manufacturers need to you pay Google a fee. So they got something out there, open source, which makes it more reliable, more scalable, but at the end of the day, they found a business model behind it. And so will Microsoft as well. Yeah. Awesome. So exciting developments at Microsoft. Um, how long do you think it's going to be before we see the, um, the public facing side of, of all of this? Soon. I don't know when, but soon, because the market <laughs> is competitive. Super competitive. Mm. They all need to get the, get the word out there as soon as possible because this Hugging Face website with tons and tons of open source AI tech already available. And they need to find a way to get around their own investment as well. So they will launch something very quickly, I feel. In fact, at the moment, not only them, every big tech company is launching their own hardware or software to do AI. And that's going to be the norm for many years to come. Um, random 
bonus question. Um, with all of them kind of developing their own um, AI tech, um, is there going to be any crossover? Because uh, let me use streaming as an example. If you want to watch program X, you're going to have to get it Netflix. If you want to watch program Y, you have to get Amazon. Uh, program Z, you have to uh, download um, or stream it through Disney+. Plus. So um, there's not really a lot of crossover. And so if you want to watch those three individual programs, you have to get all three platforms. Now, this is not necessarily from a consumer perspective, the most efficient way of going about it. So is there eventually going to be some kind of crossover where you can kind of plug two different AI models into a, um, into a device like your smartphone and utilize both of them at the same time? Right. Getting a good question that. Here's what I'm going to say. Think of the AI tools as a laptop or computer and think of the work to be done as Netflix or Prime or whatever you're using. It doesn't matter what laptop you use to get the work done. You can use a Dell laptop, you can use an Apple laptop, it doesn't matter, it's agnostic of it. And I think in the future, it will, it will not matter which AI tool you use to get the work done, it'll be agnostic of it. People will replace one with the other because at the end of the day, AI is a black box. You put something in, you something out. And that black box will be replaceable. And so the money really is, in my head, is not in building the LM. The money really is to own the customer in one way or the other. So in that in that form, you have the obviously the open, open AI way, which is a closed source way. Bizarre is called open AI, at least closed source. <laughs> and then you have the meta way, which is the open, open source way. And there they are getting the usage of their tool to get, make the AI tool better, which you can then deploy into their Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram ecosystem to help grow their opportunity there. So both approaches work really well, but at the end of the day, I don't think people are gonna care about the AI tool itself. All they care about is they can use a different tool. And as tools get better in the in the top the pop parts, as it were, of, of AI, um, people will use one over the other and they'll replace them as and an find a better tool in the market. Fantastic. Um, I look forward to the day that I don't have to use more than one AI tool. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, so um, thanks, Raj. We've come to the end of the episode. Um, thank you for uh, for sharing your your thoughts and views. Um, to the listeners, uh, let us know what you, uh, let let us know what you think in the comments. Um, we we'd love to engage with you and uh, find out what your views are on uh, Microsoft's new MAI One development. Um, and otherwise, don't forget to subscribe. Um, whatever uh, here on YouTube, um, wherever you get your podcasts. And yeah, until next time. Thanks, Raj. Thank you, Megan.